in August of 1995, Hurricane Felix was bearing down on the East Coast. Uh, the storm was initially expected to hit the Outer Banks of North Carolina, and in fact, 200,000 people were evacuated from that area. But when the storm uh, reached Bermuda, the track became less certain. And so the National Hurricane Center issued a hurricane warning for an area uh, from Little River, South Carolina in the south to Chincoteague, Virginia in the north. That's an area that included the southern portion of the Chesapeake Bay and the U.S. naval base at Norfolk, Virginia. At the time, I was a young officer serving aboard a guided missile destroyer that was home ported in Norfolk. Uh, there's an old aphorism that says a ship in harbor is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Uh, that's true the vast majority of the time, but there is one important exception. A ship caught in port during a hurricane is actually uh, very vulnerable. A storm surge can cause tremendous damage both to a ship and to its dock. And so when the National Hurricane Center projected that Hurricane Felix might make landfall at Norfolk, the ships in port, all of them at the time that could do so, were ordered out into open water, into the storm. The orders came on short notice, of course. And as we made preparations to get underway, all of us were nervous and unsure what to expect. Uh, that experience is on my mind as we begin what promises to be a stormy year, both for our United Methodist Church and for our nation. As people of faith, uh, we could hunker down within the walls of this congregation seeking shelter from the storm that's coming. We, we could do that. But then that's not what the church was built for. As followers of Christ, we are called to be in the world but not of the world. This is a point that's made in the earliest texts of the New Testament, which were written by the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> in the letter to the Philippians, Paul tells us that our citizenship is in heaven, but he's also clear that we are the body of Christ with work to do in the world. And his letters are filled with instructions about how our behavior should help transform the world. Which means that as disciples, we're called uh, not to hide from the storm, but to sail into it, to meet head on the world and its challenges and all its tumult and strife with all of its rancor and divisions. The question is uh, how to do that while staying spiritually healthy. And so for these three weeks, we're uh, going to be in a sermon series that we're calling Divided striving for unity in an angry world. And in this series, we're going to be trying to answer that question. <clears throat> now, just a note here about timing. As a church staff, uh, we've been talking about this sermon series for a couple of months now. We settled on the title um, of the sermon series, the name of the sermon series, before Thanksgiving. And one of the ways that we advertise sermon series is occasionally to put a banner out by the church sign. Uh, now, for this series, that sign happened to go up just as the most recent proposal for the future of the United Methodist Church was released to the public, <laughs> which immediately made national headlines. The timing was terrible on this because that proposal uh, misinterpreted by the national media um, as an agreement to split the United Methodist Church. That's, what, that's kind of what the headlines said, uh, split it into various factions. That's actually not an accurate description of that proposal. Uh, Don and I are going to be hosting an information session next week in Trinity Hall after the 11 o'clock service. If you uh, have questions, you want to hear more. But my point is that, that the headline for the series, Divided, is intended neither to be a commentary on nor a prediction about the future of Methodism. Uh, it's intended, rather, to simply describe the state of our public discourse, which can be pretty unproductive these days. You've seen this in action, I'm sure. It's not just that we uh, passionately hold beliefs and values. I think that's a good thing. I have lots of passionately held beliefs and values myself. Uh, the problem is when uh, we question the integrity or the morality or the faith or the patriotism of those who have different passionately held beliefs and values. The problem comes when we attack and dismiss and disparage those with whom we disagree, present company excluded, I trust. 
but you know what I'm talking about. And because this is the state of our public discourse right now, in a year that will include both another General Conference of the United Methodist Church and a presidential election, I imagine that it's going to get pretty stormy out there in the coming months. So the question is, what is a faithful Christian to do? Well, to help answer this question, we're going to be exploring Paul's letter to the Romans throughout the three weeks of this series. Paul's letter to the Romans is actually the last of his letters. It was written in the late 50s. But even the last of Paul's letters were still written earlier than the earliest of the Gospels. And what that means is that in Paul's letters, we get our, our earliest glimpse of the church. And the truth is that the early church was deeply divided over a central issue of faithful practice. We, we often lose sight of this today. In the early decades of the church's life, we had to decide just how Jewish converts to Christianity had to be. Because Jesus himself and all of his earliest disciples were members of the Jewish faith, after all. And Paul had been a devout Jew before he met Christ on the road to Damascus. All of these earliest disciples kept the law of Moses. But Paul's ministry was to Gentiles, meaning those who had not been raised in the religious tradition of the earliest Christians. The question is, should they, these Gentile converts, have to keep the law? Figuring out how to build a church comprised both of Gentile Christians and of Jewish Christians was the primary challenge in those early decades. And it's impossible to overstate just how huge a theological argument the early church had. I personally think we can take comfort from the fact that the church has faced divisive subjects literally from the beginning. We know how to deal with divisive subjects. So it's, it's to this audience that Paul writes his letter to the Romans. <clears throat> We're going to start out in chapter 1. This first passage, these two verses, are considered by many scholars to be um, the, the programmatic verse for Romans, meaning the, the, the verse, the line, actually two verses, that set the tone for the rest of the letter and make his argument. So listen, friends, for the word of God, as it is proclaimed by God's servant, the apostle Paul. For I am not ashamed of the gospel. I mean, I love that. <laughs> I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Greek there means Gentile. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith. As it is written, the one who is righteous will live by faith. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So it's impossible to overstate the importance of Paul's letter to the Romans in the history of Christianity, in the history of Christian theology and the development of Christian theological thinking. Romans is foundational to our understanding of what it means to be Christian. This is the last of Paul's letters, as I've said. It was written near the end of more than two decades of ministry. That means that it's the product of a pastor and a preacher who had spent his life, had devoted his life to introducing new people to the gospel, to introducing new people to the God revealed in Jesus Christ. Paul suffered for the gospel. His passion was bringing new people into the church. And in his earlier letters, what he would do is <clears throat> plant a congregation, and he would go to plant a different congregation, and they, he would hear about problems that, were, uh, that had cropped up in the congregation he had planted, and he would write a letter back to them, and he would be trying to solve very specific problems and answer very specific questions. And those early letters of his, uh, in those letters, he, he passionately and sometimes angrily and in at least one case in very colorful language in the Greek, uh, confronts what he considers to be misinterpretations of the gospel, misinterpretations of Christian theology. That's the early letters. But Romans, on the other hand, uh, is, is thoughtful. It's reflective. My study Bible calls it the product of a mature mind. It's the closest thing that we have in Paul's letters to systematic theology, which means it's the earliest example of systematic theology that we have 
in the history of the church. And unlike all of those earlier previous letters, Paul's writing to a church that he did not found. Uh, He had friends who were part of the church in Rome, but he himself had not planted that church. And the context of that church is important to make sense of what Paul is trying to do here. The church in Rome had been planted probably in the early 40s. That makes it one of the earliest churches in the history of Christianity. And in the year 49 AD, uh, an emperor named Claudius expelled the Jews from Rome. We know this according to Roman historians. We don't know exactly why he did that, but it is clear that Gentile Christians remained in Rome and they continued to practice their faith and they continued to grow their congregations. That exile of Jews and Jewish Christians lasted until the year 54, so five years. Um, And then when Claudius died, Jews were allowed to return to Rome, including Jewish Christians, among whom were some of Paul's friends and relatives. And apparently, there was tension between the Gentile Christians who had never left Rome and the returning Jewish Christians who were coming back after five years of exile. These two Christian groups came from two very different backgrounds. The group in power, the Greek or the Gentile Christians had never observed the law. They had no background in the rituals and traditions of their Jewish brothers and sisters, Jewish Christian brothers and sisters. And they had grown the church for half a decade in the absence of this other group. The returning group, the Jewish Christians, uh, had lived their entire lives as part of the faith history of Israel. They, they no doubt uh, understood these Gentile Christian brothers and sisters to be Johnny-come-latelys <laughs> to God's party. And they almost certainly resented the fact that while they were in exile, these Gentiles had taken over the best seats in the pews and all the positions of power. Because most human struggles, after all, <laughs> in some way or another, come down to a quest for power. All of which means that Paul is writing to a congregation that had deep and no doubt to some irreconcilable divisions. And in his opening chapter, he states clearly the theme for the letter, which becomes the foundation for Christian theology ever since. I am not ashamed of the gospel, he writes, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. No more conditions than that. Everyone who has faith is in a right relationship with God. That's what Paul says. That's his argument in Romans. And this is a claim that has far-reaching expectations. In his specific context, that means that it doesn't matter if you're a, a Gentile Christian or a Jewish Christian. In a more updated context, it doesn't matter if you prefer traditional worship or modern worship. It doesn't matter who you vote for or who you love or what you've done or what you've not done. The theme of Romans is the universality of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The theme of Romans is the foundational theological claim that the gospel is for everyone who has faith. The theme of Romans is directed to a church that has deep divisions. It's an argument that he's making to the Gentiles who never left Rome. He essentially says, don't be too haughty or high-handed. God's promise was originally to Israel after all, and God does not renege on God's promises. He spends a fair amount of time in Romans talking about that specifically. But it's it's also an argument that he's making to the Jewish Christians who were irritated upon their return to Rome by all these Gentiles who had taken over their church. God is the God of the newcomer every bit as much as God is the God of the old timer. I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says right here at the beginning of Romans. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith. And after making that initial claim in the first chapter, he spends several chapters unpacking it. So we'll uh, we'll jump now to the third chapter. We're going to read chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Uh, This, if you've been around the church for a while, this may sound familiar, particularly if you grew up in an evangelical tradition. There's going to be one verse in here that is very familiar. Listen again, friends, for the Word of God. 
But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been disclosed and is attested by the law and the prophets, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. (laughs) For there's no distinction since all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. They are now justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a sacrifice of atonement by his blood effective through faith. He did this to show his righteousness because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over the sins previously committed. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies the one who has faith in Jesus. Amen. Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians were trying to figure out how to live together. These two groups had, had differences of opinion, serious dis- differences of opinion about serious issues of theology. They had different histories. They had different customs. They had different ways of looking at the world. It got a bit stormy for the church in Rome. To a church divided, Paul has a simple message. We are all in the same boat. (laughs) We can figure this out. He says, keep in mind two principles. First, everyone is offered a relationship with God through faith. We're all children of God, whatever our differences. And second, we're all cut from the same imperfect cloth. All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Consequently, the Christian life must be grounded in humility. Christian living must be built upon a foundation of this this honest assessment of just who and what we really are. Children of God, first and foremost, absolutely invited to a relationship with God, but limited, flawed, imperfect children of God, each of us just doing the best we can to live faithful lives in community with one another. And when you read Paul's letters, tracing the development of his thought from his earliest letter, which is 1 Thessalonians, all the way to Romans, the importance of humility is a consistent theme. And in almost 2,000 years now of Christian tradition, humility has been considered the cornerstone of all spiritual progress. It's an essential part of spiritual maturity. Theological humility means allowing for the possibility that I might actually be wrong, and that you might actually be right. Theological humility means accepting the fact that even though I may be 100% convinced that you're wrong, I know that we're still both flawed and imperfect fellow children of God. A, A Christian life grounded in humility does not insist on its own way. It is not arrogant or boastful or rude, to paraphrase another of Paul's letters. And if we spend any time at all watching talking heads on TV or reading the comment section underneath any news article online, don't recommend that, stay out of there, it's nasty in there, (laughs) or uh, the heated back and forth on non-sports related social media posts, (laughs) and even some sports-related social media posts, it becomes readily apparent just how badly we need humility in our discourse. Because uh, it seems that there's way more heat than light in our disagreements these days. During the six years we were in Sherman, our two sons had the chance to play their various sports with lots of the same kids. So their soccer teammates were, their basketball teammates were, their baseball teammates, and that meant that uh, we got to know some of the families of their teammates pretty well. And there was one mom uh, who was super passionate about watching her sons play. And at one of these games, uh, this mom was very excitedly cheering on our team. Too excitedly for her daughter, (laughs) who was uh, in high school at the time, she was watching her little brothers play, watching her mom, um, you know, pretty excited about that game. She said, mom, 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 you're at a 10. I'm going to need you at a two. (laughs) (laughs) And it's become a running joke between my wife, Whitney, and me. But actually, 
not just a joke, <laughs> a pretty helpful way of reducing tension in stressful situations when one of us is overreacting to something or being a bit more intense than the situation calls for. I'll be honest with you, it's usually me <laughs> that's overreacting to something or being too intense. And we can say to each other, honey, 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 you're at a 10, I'm gonna need you at a two. And I imagine that that's how Paul was feeling when he was writing to a divided community in Rome. We're all in this together. We got disagreements, it's true, but we're all in this together. Let's be at a two, not a 10, when we're talking about these things. And I'm guessing that the year 2020 is gonna provide lots of opportunities for all of us, both in our nation and in our United Methodist Church, to gently remind ourselves from time to time that life is much more healthy in community when we're closer to a two than a 10. The next two weeks of this series, we're gonna talk about what that looks like uh, in practice. As we sailed into Hurricane Felix in August of 1995, the, the water got rougher and rougher. And I don't remember just how high the seas got, but I do remember very clearly that we were taking rolls between 30 and 45 degrees. That's a lot if you've ever been on the water. And that means that as you're walking down the, the passageways, uh, your feet end up on the bulkhead on this side, the wall on this side, and the wall on this side as the ship rolls from port to starboard. It got uh, so bad that the captain ordered everyone who was not on duty to remain in their living areas, preferably in our racks, in our uh, bunks. And we all had to strap ourselves in when we were sleeping. That's how much we were rolling because we didn't want anybody to roll out of their bed and onto those steel decks. And there were plenty of queasy sailors on that ship, including guys who had been doing this all their lives. And it got a bit dicey. But here's the thing. It didn't last all that long. We made it through just fine. Felix ended up not making landfall at all, and we returned to port safely, no worse for the wear. Because uh, ships, you see, are built for storms and are in fact not safest when they're trying to hide from them. It's a pretty good metaphor for the church, I think. So friends, as we venture into what promises to be a lively year. <laughs> May we give each other the grace of knowing that we're all children of God, all in this together. May we start with the humility that only God has all the answers. And may we remember that the gospel is for everyone who has faith, even if they do not see the world as we do. May it be so. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.